Well, hello everyone. Happy Wednesday. Thanks so much for joining us here on our Napa Valley Wine Academy Facebook page. My name is Christian Ogenfuss and I'm one of the founders of Napa Valley Wine Academy. So great to have you uh, joining us today. Um, and if you have joined us before, you know that Wednesdays is all about study hall and all about uh, tasting uh, techniques, usually at the WSET level three level or the diploma level. Uh, today is all about tasting techniques at the WSET level three level. It's going to be on two wines. They are both fortified wines and we're going to ask you to put in um, or follow along on the, um, the tasting note and then put your guess into the comment section on what wine you think it is. And uh, to lead us through this uh, exciting challenge uh, and presentation is uh, Monica Vescovi, one of our instructors here, an MW student and diploma holder from the WSET. So let me bring her on screen here. Hey, Monica, how are you? Very well. Welcome, everyone. So happy to have you here with us on this beautiful Wednesday afternoon. We're going to discuss two fortified wines, and I would really like you to put your hat on to focus on several things. You know, when we're discussing fortified wines, yes, it is all about alcohol levels and understanding differences in alcohol levels because those are different for different styles of wine. But once we're following through, especially at level three or farther, diplomas are actually preparing for the exam now, so that there will, will be some useful information here as well. But if you're looking at the appearance, appearance will be giving you right away information um, what styles of wine you could be expecting in a glass. So uh, actually, it's all about reading what is in a glass and looking for evidence in a glass what you're going to uh what you're going to have in a glass and what will be your conclusion at the end what i would like you to focus on is the um differences not only in appearance but also differences that lead you to the different qualities because with fortified wines it's extremely important that you understand the styles and they understand the levels of quality. So I'll walk you through the first note. And if you look in my glass, I'll, uh, you look into my glass, you'll see that the color is a pale amber. And that will be your first indicator of what this could wine be. Uh, so mark that down, um, point, it, point at it uh, at the end when we get to the conclusion. So Going from here, we're going to um, well, we're going to uh, look at the uh, what the nose is offering. So, medium plus intensity of aromas. An important thing when you're tasting a fortified wine is to uh, actually be really mindful of the alcohol level. The alcohol level in some of the wines, uh, like ports, for example, is high. So when you have a high alcohol uh, and you bring up that glass um, to your nose, the alcohol is the first thing you're going to smell. It is the third uh, sensation that you're going to taste as well. So a clue here when you're tasting fortified wines and when you're smelling fortified wines is to look for the integration of alcohol, for the balance between the alcohol and intensity of aromas, for the balance on the palate as well. That integration of alcohol will be your clue for quality as well. So be mindful of alcohol and don't judge that high level alcohol yet as the uh, point that actually takes away from quality. Make sure that you know that quality is led by balance of alcohol with other structural factors. So going from here, we know it is a medium intensity wine. And now the notes that I'm getting on the nose are nutty, the um, hazelnut, the uh, walnut as well. There are aromas of almonds. This is, those are the leading points for you for your conclusion. So bready aromas, uh, slightly yeasty aromas, herbs, hairy and briny aromas, and some of the lemon peel as well. So 
keep those in mind. Those will indicate the style of wine. Um, you do want to, with fortified wines, particularly with the second one I'm going to show you, the other observations can be uh, can be important. So, so, so uh, keep again. This uh, can be an indicator of some of the styles of wine and development. This is a fully developed wine. Now let's go to the palate and let's taste the wine. So this is a dry wine with medium acidity, which is a giveaway here as well, and a medium alcohol. But again, be mindful of level of alcohol. You want to know if the alcohol is well integrated. That's one thing. But a specific thing about fortified wines is understanding levels of alcohol. Is it low, medium or high? And those levels of alcohol are different for still wines and fortified wines. We start at 15% as a low, uh, low alcohol. So here we are at 18%, I give you a hint, and that is a medium alcohol. How to study that? Uh, the best way, of course, is practice. Buy several bottles of fortified wines, line them up and taste for that one thing in particular, which is alcohol. So sometimes, you know, you, when you're studying, when you're preparing, you can focus just on one thing, you know, it's sort of like putting on a hat. Right now, I'm thinking of alcohol. I'm only thinking of that burning sensation um, in my mouth. And I'm only thinking about how the alcohol is integrated in the wine. And when you do that, and when you have a lineup of several fortified wines, you are actually able to understand different level, to understand your sensation. Because, you know, it's one thing uh, that you hear about the uh, sensations of burning uh, uh, of alcohol, but you have to understand them for you. They are different for every single person. So practice of levels of alcohol is crucial for you to be able to pinpoint them uh, and to understand them. Uh, of course, at level three, uh, you won't get the, the, the 45 wines during the exam. However, tasting those wines actually gives you a lot of information when it comes to preparation for theory. And during the theory exam, you can be sure that one of the questions will be focused on fortified wines. Uh, so, this is a part of your study and preparation as well. So medium plus body, medium plus intensity of flavors and uh, medium plus finish. So when it comes to flavor uh, characteristics, this wine is driven by nutty flavor. It's driven by the hazelnut, it's driven by almonds, it's for a uh, uh, beautiful ton of a caramel here on the palate, hay, uh, bread. Um, so very, very complex wine. Um, so it has several clusters that we look at, but there's also that sort of zestiness, juiciness of lemon peel again. So this, in a conclusion, um, this wine is a very good wine. Uh, will it change over time? No, so this, this wine does not have the potential for aging when we look at the level three. I will summarize now for you the, play, the tasting notes that you should be looking at. And I would like you now to, to put that uh, hat of, uh, uh, of study and preparation for level three exam and figure out what could this wine be? So a pale amber with medium plus intensity driven by the um, nutty of aromas uh, and we have the walnuts, we have hazelnuts, almonds, uh, bready aromas, some hay and some of the uh, zesty uh, lemon peel. Uh, it is dry, which is a very important information here for the style um, as well, with medium acidity, which leads you to the place of uh, origin, 
medium alcohol, which leads you to this style, and medium plus body, medium plus intensity, and medium plus finish, very good quality. So let's take another 30 seconds. Let's, what I would like you to know, uh, to, to, to actually tell me now at this point, what is the wine? But with thin wine, or, uh, or <clears throat> I would like you to tell me what is the style? Because there are several styles that we can look at, and those things that are pointed out actually should be leading you to one particular style of fortified wines. So, okay, so we're we're winning. We have some yet. some guests some guesses in here. Uh, someone put okay. uh, earlier. Uh, Steve uh, put in. Looks like looks and sounds like sherry to me. And then Shelley wrote um, fino fino sherry. Um, and Leland and Allison also saying uh, sherry. Um, uh, yeah. So that's what we have so far. So okay. everyone leaning towards the sherry camp. Very good. So we know it, it is sherry. So very good. It is. Uh, sherry, those ready yeasty uh, aromas are leading you to sherry. Um, but now you mentioned the fino. The first thing that I ask you to look at is the color. If you take a look at the color of this wine, we have an amber color wine. So when we start with the um, uh, with the color, when you look at the color it's important that you know which color is associated with which style of wine. So amber uh, is actually associated with uh, some of the um, w w wine styles, some of the sherry styles that will be oxidative. Because if, you, if this was a pino, that uh, color would be lemon that color would be much um would have much less of the coloration less less of the pigmentation so that that appearance right away is taking you from the finger and it's actually placing you in other two styles that you can look at which would be an amontillado and Oloroso. It could possibly uh, be a Palo Cortado, but at this point, let's focus on, on the major styles, which are the Amontillado and Oloroso. And now, if you <coughs> discarded the Fino, now you want to focus which one of those two could could this be. Uh, and this th this comes a, a little tricky, because now you have to get down into aroma characteristics. If if this was uh, an Oloroso, we're looking at for those tertiary notes driven by the uh, by the uh, caramel, driven by nuttiness, but also driven by a, a number of tertiary aromas that and flavors. But we had that zesty lemon peel to the to to the aroma and flavor. We had that brine to the aroma and flavor. Where that is it coming from? You probably guessed that already. This is an anamontillado. So this wine starts in a, uh, in a solera as a fino, but ends oxidatively as oloroso. So start, starts uh, its life um, biologically and then ends it oxidatively. Therefore, it matches both styles and it has some character of the pheno on the nose and the palate so those will be the <clears throat> the uh those points that you really want to look into when you are deciding where is it an amontillado is it an oloroso oloroso often will be even deeper in color as well that will be your next Point of course uh, be, between Amontillado and Oloroso, the indicator of alcohol is also an indicator. Which wine do you have in a glass? That would alcohol would discard Pino as well, which very often is around 15.5 percent. So those were your pointers for the sherry. Let's taste the second wine really quickly. So let's see. Uh, let's see what, what did, do we have in the glass. In the meantime, um, I will show you what we taste. What, what I was tasting. This was the um, Tio Diego Sherry uh, Amontillado. 
Um, and um, it spent 10 years in the Solera. Um, so now moving on to the second one, uh, it is a deep ruby wine. So it has pronounced intensity of the nose. And there is that very one thing that I was talking about before that I would like Uh, especially when we're talking about fortified wine, wines, which is deposit. So I'm noticing a deposit in a glass. I'm making a mental note of that deposit in a glass. So from from here, I'm looking at the nose. I'm looking at the nose. I'm going to the nose, and I'm uh, actually smelling it right here already, which means this is a pronounced intensity, and pronounced intensity of really complex aroma of, first of all, black fruit, so black cherry, blackberry, uh, licorice, some of the raisins, also some of the violets, but then it moves on to uh, cloves and nutmegs. For the first, quite a bit of spice on the notes, um, enchanting notes of leather, butterscotch, uh, prune, uh, uh, really ripe figs, and jamie. There's, if you look at my note, there's so much that I'm able to write about this one, which leads us to the uh, later on to the conclusion. There is so much complexity on the nose of this wine. This is another mental note that I want to make right now. This is a developing wine. Why? Because there is still quite a lot of aromas, primary aromas on the nose. So this is another thing that I want to check, you know, that that, that it's my giveaway what this one could be, but that I will get there at conclusion. So once we taste it. This wine is sweet. Now it does have a medium acidity, but definitely high alcohol. But the quality of alcohol is so amazingly beautifully integrated with intensity of fruit. There's a lot of intensity, the fruit, the, the, the flavors are pronounced and the body is full. So when it comes to flavors, just like in aromas, there's so much complexity. Um, and there, there are black plums, blackberries, black cherries, uh, licorice, there's chocolate here, uh, cloves, uh, vanilla, figs and prunes, and the uh, butterscotch and a little bit of leather as well. So uh, now from here, this wine has an amazingly long finish. And in a conclusion, if you look at the my note, actually we're checking all the points for the outstanding quality. There's a great balance between the uh, tannins and the intensity uh, of the fruit. The tannins actually um, on this wine is medium uh, plus. The tannins is plush. The tannins is really ripe um, uh, for, for this wine. Uh, which also tells me about the quality of the fruit. Uh, and the, there is the pronounced intensity on both aromas and flavors. Um, there is a phenomenal complexity of this wine. If you look at the tasting notes, you will check in not only primary, secondary, and tertiary, but we're checking a lot of the groups, uh, flavor groups within each of the um, of the groups of the aromatics. So that tells us there is a great complexity. Uh, is this wine suitable for aging? Definitely, yes. Why? How do I know that? Well, first of all, we had um, we had the uh, primary flavors and primary aromas, but we also have the tannins, uh, the acid acidity is uh, medium, however, but it is well balancing the sweetness. Uh, so the wine is capable of aging. And now, knowing that, let me run you through it. Deep garnet in color, this is your indicator, pronounced both of aromas and intensity. Uh, all of the groups uh, of the aromas and flavors, so primary, secondary, and tertiary. This is a sweet wine. That's an indicator of the 
style as well. Uh, the high alcohol, high in this case 20%, that will be your giveaway. Also, full body, uh, pronounced flavors, and the long finish. Where are we? What is the wine? And we've seen that, what is the style of wine? So, which region are we at, and what's the style of wine? Okay, so let's play a little Jeopardy music to give them a moment to put in their answers uh, here in the comment section. So, away with the music. So, so very good. So, so you are in the ruby style because if you uh, so, so the the uh, ruby LBV and vintage are in the ruby style. Where was your indicator? Of course, the indicator was in the color right away. But the indicator was also in other factors, in flavor components, in aroma components as well. Now, in order to make sure that you know the, your quality levels between Ruby, LBV, and Vintage Board, there are some points that you would be looking at to have a good understanding. So, uh, Ruby port will be um, made for a, uh, for a quicker consumption. So if we concluded that this is an outstanding wine suitable for aging, that would discard Ruby right away. Ruby would not have the complexity of this wine, which we're talking about several clusters of aromas and flavors. Ruby would not have that many clusters of aromas and flavors. Um, so that we're putting Ruby on the side. Now we're looking between LBV and vintage. So LBV meaning late bottle vintage, which will have a vintage on the uh, label. It will come from a particular year and vintage port. So two points. And if you're thinking uh, that it's a vintage port or LBV, I would like you to put, to actually put in uh in the box what vintage could this be just let's make it just a little harder and let's see what are you gonna come up with because it's one of those so let's put the vintage on it but the, be, before <laughs> i'll ask you to do it now and before we get there i'll explain differences in the style between the lbv and vintage so when lbv is made and especially uh if it's filtered it will be again made for quicker consumption. It will not be developing uh, in, the, uh, in a bottle uh, anymore. It, it, when it is unfiltered, it has a potential for development and it will be throwing the sediment. So remember when, uh, when we were talking about other observation, I told you there is sediment. So now we're narrowing it down. It can be an LBV that is unfiltered and it can be a vintage port. So let's go a little farther. Well, first of all, I was talking about the amazing complexity of this wine. I was also talking about the outstanding quality because uh, we we did have a long finish, we did have a pronounced uh, aromas and flavors, we did have the complexity, and we did have the balance. So we have the, uh, so we concluded this is an outstanding quality. Okay, so the some of the LBVs can get to the outstanding, but most of them will end uh, with their the quality level at the very good. But now that fine line between the, the, the very good and outstanding, it's actually uh, belongs to the complexity, to typicity um, as well, 
and to the depth of the wine, to the structural differences in the wine. So the depth, the complexity, the length of this wine are all leading me to the vintage port. So it is about the structural component. It is about the complexity. It is about the integration of alcohol. It is the fine tannins, the really ripe tannins that are beautifully integrated. So looking at all of that leads me to the vintage. Now, did anybody put the vintage in? Yeah, so we have some, uh, uh, a lot of people played along. So Allison thought it was 2012, could be 2012. Melissa said 2014. So we have a couple of those. So did Shelly. Uh, Leland says 2010. Patrick, 2011. And Steve went for a little bit older with 1997. Okay, so this is actually a little older than, than that, but we did have information about the tertiary aromas and the amount of tertiary aromas could be leading you to, to the vintage. Actually, in the vintage that we had, we had the perfect weather conditions uh, with a fairly cold winter, uh, but break was a little early, flowering in May, beautiful hot and slightly at some points too hot of a summer so there were some heat spikes of uh, the summer but it was called a textbook growing season with just some of the day temperature uh, spiking to midday 32 degrees celsius so um it is described as a power and concentration but because it's such a classic vintage and such a great vintage, this is 1985 and the color is still there. We still have the ruby. There's just a hint of garnet, but not enough to call it garnet. Yet the tertiaries are there, but they're not overwhelming. So, you know, when you're tasting a vintage pot, and again, this comes with time, this comes with the, um, with uh, lining up, several vintages or writing notes in several vintages and having a good understanding of the differences and understanding that with that complexity and what makes the vintage board is that outstanding quality to age and to feel much younger still being 1985. That's what puts this wine aside of uh, aside of many others. So this is Daos, 19, let me show you, Daos, 1985. So I hope uh, you did enjoy the tasting. Um, bravo to those who who ended up with the with cherry, with Amontillado and the vintage food. If you are preparing for the examination, uh, good luck. And I'll see you soon in the classroom in Facebook Live and hopefully we'll see you this week because we have some amazing things lined up for you actually in the next few days. Great. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Monica. What, and thank you everyone for playing along. Really great interactions today. Uh, really appreciate that. Makes it a lot of fun um, to, to participate. A couple of reminders for you. Of course, we have the uh, wine trivia coming up uh, next Monday at 2 p.m. as usual. Uh, but this weekend, uh, Friday, uh, October 23rd, is uh, Champagne Day. So make sure you uh, get your champagnes and um, follow along uh, with hashtag Champagne Day uh, and participate. Uh, and then also um, this Saturday, we have um, a great interview with Stephen Spurrier, a free live webinar that you can find on our website that you can sign up for. Highly encourage you to do that. Uh, there are some wines to taste along with that. Uh, but even if you don't have the wines, you'll want to join us for uh, that Stephen Spurrier interview with Peter, uh, with Peter Marks. In the meantime, uh, I hope you have a great rest of your week, a great weekend, and we'll see you, uh, if not during Champagne Day and on the webinar, we'll see you next Monday here for Wine Trivia. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Cheers.